they really wanted to go, and so we had this big plan, and I thought, great, you know, I won't be thinking about my work at all, because this will be, you know, just totally removed from everything that I'm interested in. And that turned out not to be the case, uh, because we got to the Ellis Island Museum, and one of the first exhibits I encountered at the Ellis Island exhibit, uh, Museum was entitled Opening the West, U.S. Expansion, 1783 to 1853, opening the West. And I thought, I thought, oh, here we go. <laughs> um, and so this big map, it was, a, it was a small exhibit. It's basically a big map with a few paragraphs uh, of text. And, and, and basically, my, my sense of the, this exhibit's place in the rest of the museum is to say that we're not all about everybody coming through Ellis Island. We want to have a little bit of mention of people who came in from other places. And so the exhibit consisted of a, a large map of the United States that had uh, demarcated the Louisiana Purchase, the Northwest Territories, Territories, Texas, and then all of the rest of land as California, marked literally labeled California, um, and uh, an explanation that uh, that this this land labeled California on the map was acquired in 1848 with the end of the U.S. war with Mexico. So for me, this Ellis Island exhibit was a testament to the continuing power of the ideology of manifest destiny over our national imagination. Um, and and I, think that, I think that this is a pretty powerful pull even in New Mexico and even today even despite the decades of research on colonialism in the West, it really remains the way that we like to think of ourselves. We, we think of westward expansion in terms of annexation rather than colonialism. We think of it as opening land rather than acquiring land by armed force. And we think of it as, as settling unpopulated lands rather than as displacing peoples already in those lands. The, the, second, the second way in which the exhibit spoke to me was to represent an erasure of New Mexico and, and Arizona. But New Mexico is more interesting than erasure of New Mexico. But an erasure, and of course, at the time, at the time period of, of the U.S. war with Mexico, we're talking about uh, New Mexico territory being both Arizona, what's present day Arizona and New Mexico. Um, and, and that erasure um, has to do with, I think, our unwillingness to think about the war with Mexico as, as a war in which there was resistance and conquest. And also it has to do, I think, with the fact that we're surrounded by these very important strategically important and populated uh, states, Texas and California. And, and that also contributes to the, the erasure, I think, of, of New Mexico and Arizona, which continues to, to an extent today. Um, so, so the book that I'm writing, Manifest Destinies, will be a counterpoint to this narrative. Um, my objective is to place at the forefront the 140,000 people who were living here at the time of the beginning of the American conquest here. Um, and they, those people included 60,000 Mexicans, Hispanos, or Indian Spanish mestizos, 60,000 nomadic, so-called nomadic Indians, 15,000 Pueblo Indians, and 1,000 Euro-Americans. These numbers are probably subject to a fair amount of revision, but they're, they're sort of the be best accepted numbers about the population of 1850 of the New Mexico Territory. A second objective of the book is to highlight the process of transition, the process, process of transition from one sovereign to another, but also in terms of my own interest from, from one legal system to another, and specifically from the Spanish-Mexican legal system to the Anglo-American legal system. And um, and to think about legal arenas as 
sites for uh, examining this transition as a transition of conflict, of resistance, and of negotiation, ultimately. Another important objective of the book is to, to situate New Mexico's complex racial and social relations within a national context. Um, and, and specifically to think about what was happening in, in, in particular in the South in the mid and late 19th century and relate that to what's happening in the Southwest. So I'm interested in, in three particular questions in that regard. Um, what did it mean in the context of slavery and genocide of Indians to insert into the polity 60,000 Mexicans who were granted federal citizenship under the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo? How did the formal exclusion from citizenship of both Pueblo and other Indians affect a racial hierarchy in which both free and enslaved blacks were denied the fundamental rights of citizenship? What were the connections between, and, and, and third, what were the connections between the expansion of the racial hierarchy to encompass large numbers of people presumed to be racially inferior because they were Indian or Mestizo, and the crisis brewing over slavery at mid-century, the subsequent civil war, and the later constitutional amendments regarding civil rights. So in these ways, Manifest Destinies is a study of racial formation in the sense in which Omi and Wynant uh, invoke that concept in their uh, you know, well-regarded well uh, work. Um, so what I want to do in the rest of the talk is um, first tell you a little bit about the book overall and just sort of give you a sense of what the larger project is about. And as Rebecca mentioned, I'm hoping to at least finish the first uh, draft of the book next year um, while I'm in Santa Fe. And then um, what I'm going to do is take a, a smaller piece of it, mostly based on, on part one here, and tell you about a couple of key arguments uh, related to uh, Mexican elites in New Mexico and their relationship and attitudes toward and policies towards, on the one hand, uh, blacks, both free and enslaved blacks, and on the other hand, uh, Pueblo Indians and other, other Indians. Um, and then, uh, just to kind of reiterate Rebecca's comments, what I had imagined is that I would speak until about 5 o'clock um, and then take your comments and, and questions uh, from 5 until 5.30. Certainly, if you have questions before that about uh, really kind of questions of clarification, please do interrupt and, uh, and let me know so that we don't sort of go on not meeting minds as we, as we go through the next 45 minutes. Um, okay, so let me tell you about the book. And I put the, um, I put the title of the, the three parts of the book up here. Um, uh, just sort of for, for easier reference because I you know it's I, I'm, I'm sort of old-fashioned I don't have a PowerPoint presentation I don't have anything high-tech but at least uh, at least you get some written material as we go along um, so the book is divided into three parts um, the first part is called Re remapping citizenship and race 1846 to 1869 and so the this part begins with 1846 as the beginning of the U.S. military and legal authority in New Mexico. Um, many studies begin with 1848, because that's the end of the war with Mexico and the beginning of the, the signing of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. For my purposes, it's very important to begin with when U.S. legal and military authority were, were established, which is in the summer of 1846. And then I end the first part of the book with um, in 1869 in order to encompass the Civil War and the passage of the Civil War Amendments, which were completed in 1869. The, um, the second part of the book is called Colonizing Through Law, 1870 to 1890. And this section of the book is based on um, empirical data that I've gathered about courts in uh, four New Mexico counties, San Miguel County, Taos County, Santa Fe County, and Doña Ana County. And um, some of this article, some of this work had been published in a previous article about San Miguel County, but the basic thrust of this section is to say that a very key 
institution or key mechanism through which the United States achieved power in New Mexico uh, and stability and, and sort of legitimate authority was the court system. And here I'm speaking of the, the district courts, which were conducted at the county level, the territorial Supreme Court, as well as the probate court at each county level and the justices of the peace courts, which were at precinct levels within counties. Then the third part of the book is called Making Unequal Citizens, 1891 to 1912. And in, in this final part of the book, um, the project is really to explain the roots of the 20th century racial order in New Mexico, which we take for granted, which we quite take for granted, as really being in that late 19th, early 20th century pre-statehood period. And, um, and I, I think there's just a lot of, I think, I think there's a lot of ways in which the attitudes and conflict and political disputes that we see in the 20th century really were shaped by um, positions that um, that elites took and that groups took vis-a-vis -vis each other in that in that period and even um, even things such as as names labels ethnic labels that we prefer today in New Mexico have their roots I think in that late 19th century um, so that kind of gives you an overview of, um, of the larger project. Um, what I'm going to do now is really shift to some more specific arguments and more specific evidence, I hope, um, persuasive evidence, about, uh, about the, the first, first part of the book. Um, and in particular, there are, there are two arguments that I'm going to make um, today. Uh, the first argument and so I'm going to kind of preview the arguments, and then and then we'll kind of go through a, a deeper introduction, and then and then evidence for those arguments. The the first argument is that uh, Mexicans or mestizos in New Mexico were able to situate themselves as a middle racial group in uh, the New Mexican racial hierarchy, with European Americans above them, with Pueblo Indians below them, and with other Indians below Pueblo Indians. And the, the, reasons for, the reasons for this have to do with, um, with, with three things. Uh, first, the, the sheer demographics that we see here. If, if Euro-Americans, and I use the term Euro-Americans because I'm talking both about people who were, at the time of the conquest, American citizens, but also European origin people who were not actually American citizens, but you know German nationals, Irish nationals, other uh, many of whom became naturalized out out in the West, but weren't necessarily American citizens at that time. So the 1,000 with 1,000 settlers here in New Mexico, you can imagine that this wasn't going to be a kind of colonial project that could depend in terms of sheer force on the military and on that local uh, European-American elite. So the demographics made, uh, made it very likely that, that Mexicans would be, or that some group would be deployed as, um, as the native uh, colonizers or the native handmaidens to, uh, to the colonizers. In addition, U.S. law, and specifically the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which ended the war with Mexico, uh, granted citizenship to former Mexican citizens. Uh, presumably, this included Pueblo Indians who had formal citizenship rights under the Mexican government, um, but it certainly excluded the so-called nomadic uh, Indians in New Mexico. And, and given, again, given those those demographics, uh, those demographics, and and the law made it made it so that Mexicans were able to move into this sort of middle middle um, man racial middleman group. And then the third reason that uh, Mexicans end up playing this middle role has to do with the the racial ideology and the racist ideology of white supremacy of 19th century mid 19th century America. Which, um, in which um, New Mexico was 
created as a federal territory sort of in perpetuity. Um, and then uh, when Congress limited the right to vote in New Mexico to Mexican men, specifically excluded Pueblo men and other Indian men, um, that, that was a, a real, that was another, another way in which the push toward Mexicans being defined, um, defined as, as white in a sort of a fictive official sense. Um, so, so let me let me go ahead. I'm gonna, that's sort of just a preview of that argument, which I'm going to be spending most of the talk on. But let me let me come to the second argument, which is is that this this claim to whiteness that Mexicans were allowed to embrace and chose to embrace was was fragile. And, and subject to constant challenge. And one result, I will argue, was that Mexicans were very self-conscious and constantly seeking opportunities to distance themselves from other racially subordinate groups, namely Pueblo Indians, other Indians, and blacks, both free and slaves. So that, um, that fragility of Mexicans' almost white official status itself ends up reinforcing um, their, it ends up doing two things. It ends up reinforcing Mexicans' middleman racial status and also ends up ultimately reinforcing white supremacy in the United States. So those are the arguments, um, the arguments that I want to make. And this is where my notes get a little confused, so I have to figure out where I'm, where I'm going here. Okay, so now I want to sort of give you a little bit further introduction in two ways. First, I want to, want to sort of make the point that the partly because of the documents that I'm researching, um, and this is this is some sort of a a, a limitation of. Of, of history is that at least in, in certain very powerful ways you're limited to the written documents that survive. And so the written documents, who were they written by? Well, they were written by these people and they were written by these people in some cases. And so the story that I'm seeking to tell is almost by definition the story from this perspective and, and not from, from these perspectives. And I think that's, that's important to say. Um, but I want to, to and, and I don't think this has been adequately done in, in existing literature, I want to center Mexican elites and treat them as historical agents. And I do that by focusing largely in, in this part one on the legislative acts and pronouncements and debates in the territorial legislature. And I treat those pronouncements and those debates as being the product of Mexican elites, Mexican male elites. Because throughout the, the, that period of 1846 to 1869, all of the constitutional and legislative bodies that represented the territory of New Mexico were majority Mexican. Um, and those majorities ranged from a low of two-thirds to, I'm sorry, a low of Nine, oh my goodness, let me just read the way I have it and then I'll get it right. Um, these bodies were all majority Mexican, ranging from 55% Mexican to 90% Mexican throughout that period. So I'm treating, and, that, and that's something somebody could, could argue with that, but I'm treating then the products that come out of these bodies as a reflection of Mexican elites' um, agency, will, self-determination, um, Limited as it was, and and uh, and, and you know uh, that's that's something that we can talk more about if you'd like um, in the comment section. Um, okay, the other introductory point that I want to make is is almost in, in direct contradiction to what I've just told you, and that is is I want to emphasize uh, the ways in which Mexican citizenship was very much a kind of second class citizenship. And so, in a sense, I'm saying Mexicans had agency. They were historical actors who were 
in large part, or at least in substantial part, engaged in making their own destiny. At the same time, there were important ways in which that citizenship was circumscribed. And specifically, I want to talk about five ways in which Mexican, Mexican citizenship was, was limited or circumscribed, and, and was quite literally a, a second-class citizenship. Um, so the first way in which uh, Mexican citizenship was limited was that it was limited to Mexican men. And Mexican women had substantially more rights under the Mexican sovereign than they did under the U.S. sovereign. It's important and often ignored that kind of, it kind of, kind of reminds me when I hear the contemporary debates about how the U.S. is going in and saving the Middle East and Middle Eastern women because they're bringing these new rights. It kind of makes me, gives me pause to think, well, what do we really know about what these women's situation is and what it's going to be after American colonization? And certainly in this context, I think there's lots of ways in which it wasn't an unmitigated um, good. Um, the second way in which Mexican citizenship was limited was that although there was a civil government set up in, in Formally, in 1850, when Congress made New Mexico a territory, but, but before that, and, and especially in 1848, after the end of the war, there was civil government set up in New Mexico, local courts, um, local legislatures, um, the territorial legislature. There were very important ways in which everyone accepted that military rule was in force in New Mexico in the early decades of the U.S. occupation. That, that civil political control was clearly subordinate to military rule. Um, a third way in which Mexican citizenship was circumscribed um, had to do with the fact that New Mexico was incorporated as a territory of the United States in 1850, uh, rather than um, as a state, and of course didn't become a state until 1912. So, because New Mexico was a territory um, under the Northwest Territories Ordinance, um, there were several, e even though there was a lot of similarity in some ways to how states looked in terms of courts and in terms of governance, there were some important differences, such as the following. First, Congress was legally empowered to nullify any act of the New Mexico legislature, which would not have been the case for states legislatures, state legislative acts. Um, second, because of New Mexico's territorial status, that meant that almost all of the um, important officials in the territory were appointed by the U.S. president. And the appointment was sort of like a political patronage, uh, kind of the way that we would think of ambassadors being appointed today. Um, and, and, and it's a really interesting I found some really interesting stories about how judges got appointed um, to New Mexico courts. There's one, uh, Justice Poole, who was appointed to the New Mexico Supreme Court. He had been seeking to be appointed as an Indian agent uh, in the Northwest. This wasn't what he wanted. <laughs> Instead, he gets appointed to the New Mexico Supreme Court. Um, so yeah, there's, there's interesting stories, and, and almost to a person, all of the officials appointed by the president in New Mexico in these early decades were outsiders, um, not even sometimes among these, but not usually among these people who were here, outsiders who didn't know how to speak Spanish, who had never been to New Mexico, and who oftentimes said very openly they didn't want to stay very long. Um, so that created definitely a colonial mentality um, among those who, who were the European American elites uh, in New Mexico. And then the fourth, um, the fourth point has to do with um, one of the features of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, um, which um, under which Mexicans in the conquered territory received U.S. citizenship if they if they formally elected U.S. citizenship or if they stayed in their homes beyond a year without any alternative election. Um, Many of you probably know the story of uh, Mesilla, New Mexico, which was a community 
near, um, near Las Cruces, which moved south three times to get south of the border, but the border kept moving south. <laughs> and uh, that's sort of a, a graphic example of, of the whole communities wanting to maintain their Mexican identity and, and failing in the end to do that. But what I want to point out is that there were actually many people, we don't actually know, and the primary research on this hasn't been done, but there were many people in New Mexico who were Mexican citizens who formally declared to officials in New Mexico that they wanted to maintain their Mexican citizenship. And by doing that, they were effectively disenfranchised from the polity in the United States. And there, there are some, based on some initial data that I've been collecting on this, this may have been up to 50% of the adult males in New Mexico at the time. And that's a story that hasn't been told. And it's a story that I think that politically today, people not, might not want to tell. And, and uh, it's an interesting, I think, uh, oversight. And then the fifth way in which uh, citizenship for Mexicans uh, it, uh, under the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was, was watered down was that in the 19th century United States, the value of citizenship really came from your state affiliation, not from national citizenship. And the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo provided only national citizenship. Now that's, that's, that's really changed a lot as we think about it today, but at this time, well, we're, not, we're not too far right, from the fragile establishment of the union of states and the, the real fears about uh, overbearing federal control, things were very much rooted in the states and, and you had your power in many ways from being a state citizen, a citizen of a state. That's where your rights came from rather than being a citizen of a nation. And so in this way, Mexican citizenship uh, guaranteed under, under the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was very much watered down. Okay, so um, with that, with that, let me turn now to um, to the arguments that I that I mentioned uh, about Mexicans playing a a sort of a middle middleman racial group, claiming a sort of whiteness or almost white kind of status, and the ways in which that both gave Mexicans a certain amount of self determination and power, and at the same time. Um, further entrenched uh, white supremacy. And, and the first example that I want to talk about is um, an example of, of Mexican legislators' responses to blacks, both to free blacks and to um, slavery. So, and I want to I wanna say here that, that there's a way in which um, Mexicans' uh, attitudes and legislative enactments uh, regarding blacks and regarding slavery were largely in the realm of symbolic politics. Because in 1850, at least according to the census, there were only 22 blacks in New Mexico. In 1860, there were 64 blacks, including <coughs> free and enslaved blacks. Um, so there wasn't a lot at stake materially in terms of Mexican uh, attitudes and pronouncements about uh, blacks. Uh, and I think that, that that's an important part of, of the context here. So there, there are two waves of, of responses here. The first wave is a really vociferous anti-slavery position. Um, in the 1848 and the 1850 Constitu Constitutional Conventions of New Mexico, the majority Mexican conventions are very firm that they would enter the Union as a free state. Um, in part, I think this reflects a continuation of Mexico's anti-slavery position, or at least formal anti-slavery position, um, which, as you know, was, was which many people attribute uh, the, the, the breakaway of Texas to, to that position and, and the fact that the, the white Texans weren't able to, to hold slaves under Mexican law, and so um, they ultimately broke, um, broke with Mexico. And in fact, you can some of this attitude of anti-slavery you can trace to an anti-Texas sentiment, which persists today. Um, and I say that with, with uh, acknowledgement that my maternal grandparents are were born in Texas, um, and uh, and and I still kind of feel that anti-Texas 
sentiment myself. So um, uh, part of it is, is an ongoing battle um, and an effort to distinguish ourselves from, from Texas. Um, but in truth, in the second wave response um, that I'm, I'm looking at here, there was, was an evaporation of this abolitionist um, leaning. And this occurs in the late 1850s. And there's two legislative acts that I want to give you as examples. One is a law passed in 1857 by the New Mexico Territorial Legislature, which concerned the rights of free blacks. And as a footnote here, I want to remind you, and it's something that you probably know, but I just want to put it in the, in the front of your minds, is that all of the legislation that was adopted by the Territorial Legislature was adopted in Spanish and then late, later translated. So it, it's important, I think, for us to be able to read those those original acts in Spanish um, and draw our conclusions based on those because that was the language in which things were being debated um, and, and, uh, and, and the language is sometimes very revealing. So in this act um, called a, an act concerning the rights of free blacks, um, the, the New Mexico legislature said that blacks could not stay in New Mexico for more than one month, uh, presumably passing through on their way to California. Um, said that free black men could not marry or live with white women, which was defined in the context of their other legislative acts to include Mexican women. Um, and, and had a, a bunch of other similar provisions. So it would have been similar to the, the uh, it's some of the, the free, free black codes that you would have seen in the South. And then two years later, in 1859, the New Mexico legislature um, and a legislative body which was, uh, which had, out of 37 legislatures, legislators, only three were Euro-American. Um, so a, a overwhelmingly Mexican legislature passed a slave code. And uh, the chief proponent of the slave code was a legislator I uh, just want to check one thing because I'm. Was a legislator by the name of Miguel Antonio Otero, who later became governor of New Mexico and, and was a very light skinned, light eyed uh, Mexican uh, who was, was distinguished, quite distinguished by two facts. One, that he had been educated outside of New Mexico in St. Louis. Um, so he spoke, he was fluent in English and Spanish, and that was very rare at this time. Um, and also he was distinguished because he was married to a white American woman, and specifically to a woman from um, a South Carolina slave-owning family. Um, so the provisions of this 1859 New Mexico Slave Code included the legalization and protection of white men's property and black slaves, uh, specifically black slaves. Uh, provided for punishment of slaves for violation of various rules and crimes. Um, typical of these kinds of provisions at the time was that, for instance, for rape of a white woman, a black man could be uh, executed, whereas the sentence for a white man for the same crime would be much less. Um, and it had a very important section of, uh, of, of criminal, criminal, criminalizing acts related to assisting blacks, uh, black slaves from escaping or from resisting their masters in any way. So what explains the shift from an abolitionist position to enactment of a slave code and harsh restrictions on free blacks in New Mexico? The conventional wisdom is that we, we can explain this as sort of just a, a real, um, real basic sort of political decision by the, the legislature to say, if we want to get to be a state, we're going to have to enter the, the Union as a slave state. And just sort of a, a, calculus, a change in calculus that we were, before we had thought we would enter as a free state, but now we're realizing if we want to be a state at all, we have to enter as a, as a slave state. And, and I think actually that that's, that's got some merit. I, I think that that's probably a part of what was going on. <coughs> but I want to suggest that there was another very important and not talked about dimension in the literature, which is that Mexicans in 
enacting these laws were plain symbolic politics, symbolic racial politics, that they were really seeking in enacting these laws to distance themselves from blacks and to position themselves as closer to whites. And to, to understand this, I would have to talk a lot longer about the ways in which Mexicans, me, Mexicans very much were very aware of their, it, their sort of the choice that whites had about how to classify them, about whether they were going to be classified as closer to blacks or as closer to whites. And, uh, and there's a very interesting secondary literature on, on, uh, on the travel literature, for instance, on Euro-Americans coming to New Mexico and the Southwest and to Mexico before the war. Um, interesting um, material that's been uh, culled from congressional uh, testimony uh, before the war and then, then as the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was being debated. But it's very clear that there was a very, it was a very, very obviously said at the time that Mexican, by many people that Mexicans were like Negroes or no better than Negroes and by other people that they were quite different from Negroes. And so there was really a, a a positioning going on, and um, so so this these these legislative enactments enactments in the late 1850s then can be seen as a way for Mexicans to to uh, enact a kind of social distancing from blacks, um, and again this is this is I think especially persuasive because we're talking about symbolic relations with blacks rather than any real threat or real encounters with blacks at the time. And, and at the same time, I want to offer, so at the same time that I'm saying that there's a way in which these acts show social distancing by Mexicans vis-a-vis -vis blacks, I want to argue as well that they, they show as well a kind of resistance to white supremacy, American style. And, and I think that that's somewhat controversial because we, we generally like to think about resistance as being something that we would identify with ourselves, as something that we would embrace. And there's no reason, though, that resistance has to be something that would be progressive or that would be what we would embrace in our contemporary models. But, but I think of this as resistance because it's resistance to efforts by some in the, the uh, Euro-American dominant population to classify them as black or as white blacks. Um, okay, so, so let me talk a little bit about whether or not there is much evidence for my, my claim here um, that Mexican legislators were, were race conscious and were playing symbolic politics in terms of their enactment of these bills. And here um, I want to talk uh, a little bit about a, a very important 1857 uh, Supreme Court decision called Dred Scott and its potential effect here. So in the Dred Scott case, as, as probably um, many of you know, or many of you knew at one time when you took a, a study of American history of, of that time period, um, it's probably, you know, if you sort of think about a handful, maybe there are 10 cases, Supreme Court cases that non-lawyers will have read and heard about, um, I think this would probably be um, one of them. So in the Dred Scott case, um, the Supreme Court says that neither free nor enslaved blacks can sue in federal court because they're not citizens in, in uh, the sense of having, of being members of our polity and having rights, um, even the basic right of suing in federal court. And um, the larger, larger issue I, maybe it's, it's sort of incorrect to say larger. Another issue important in the case was the Supreme Court's invalidation of the Missouri Compromise, um, which had banned slavery in the Louisiana Purchase. So it was a very key decision um, at that time. And I thought, uh, well, wouldn't it be interesting to look and see whether or not Dred Scott had any impact in New Mexico and whether or not since the Slave Act gets enacted um, by the legislature two years later, whether or not there's some connection. And so I very excitedly started pouring through the newspapers between 1857 and 1858, all those that I could find from that period here, and I found absolutely no reference <laughs> to the Dred Scott decision. Nothing, nothing, not even a tiny little thing. You know, so it may, it may as well not have happened. 
I was beginning to lose hope. But then I came across a letter, a letter from Miguel Antonio Otero, the blue-eyed, light-skinned fellow I mentioned earlier, who was, uh, at the time that he wrote the letter, the New Mexico's delegate to Congress, a non-voting delegate to Congress, the way that the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico have a non-voting delegate to Congress today. Um, and and it, was, it, was actually, it was actually a very interesting story about how he became a delegate to Congress, and he was the first New Mexico delegate to Congress who could speak English, which was his big running point, his big platform point. It'd be good to send someone to Washington who could actually understand the proceedings that were going on and talk to the people there. Um, uh, anyway, so he, he, um, he writes a letter um, to the leaders of the territorial legislature in which he mentions the Dred Scott case and says specifically, quote, it is in our interest to affirm the position of New Mexico on slavery after this case. And he recommends that the legislature enact a slave code and, quote, immediately send it to the leading newspapers in southern states. So I think that there is some evidence, it's not, uh, it's not an overwhelming kind of evidence, I think, but there is some evidence that suggests that this development in, in national uh, black-white racial politics had some impact in terms of what was happening in the Southwest, in terms of how Mexicans here were viewing themselves and were positioning themselves in the broader uh, U.S. racial hierarchy. Um, and I think, I still think that the statehood, the statehood slavery politics explanation is a very important piece of it, but I think this is another another additional piece of it. So, um, okay, I'm going to shift gears another time now, and I'm going to talk, um, and I'm going to see how much time we have to, to talk about this, this other part of my evidence for this argument, which is, which has to do with Mexicans' relationships with Indians um, in New Mexico. And um, so, so, to think of, of a transition, if we think about Mexicans' uh, legislative acts with respect to free blacks and slave blacks as largely symbolic, we have to think of Mexicans' relationships and acts towards Pueblo Indians and other Indians as, as in, intensely material, right? And, and certainly there would be symbolic dimensions as well, but here we're talking about real, um, real uh, coexistence. And in the case of Pueblo Indians, we're talking about communities, often by design, very close to each other. We're talking about uh, cultural commonalities, given that, that uh, Pueblo Indians were forced and, and later voluntarily converted to Catholicism. We're talking about um, uh, shared, and, and shared resources and conflicts over resources in terms of land and water, which persist into the contemporary period. Um, and, and so there's, there's a way in which uh, we have to view these, these acts, I think, in a, a different light um, than, than, and than just in the symbolic politics kind of a, a frame. Okay, so, so and I'm going to, because I, I want to get a little bit further, I'm going to skip around a little bit here, so I hope that it, um, that it won't be, um, that it will, will be uh, coherent. Um, okay, so, so let me talk a little bit about the, the positions of the early territorial legislatures on the issue of Pueblo um, citizenship first, and then if we have time, we'll get to Mexicans' positions and, and ask with respect to other, other Indians. Um, as I mentioned before, because, partly because Mexicans had provided citizenship to uh, Pueblo Indians, there was a, a kind of assumption, I think, a starting position that Pueblo Indians were enfranchised and had the same rights as, um, as Mexicans, or at least as Mexican men did, under the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. And, and it, it seems from, from, from certain acts that this was true. Uh, for instance, in the 1850 uh, Statehood Convention, uh, Mexicans were defined as white men and were enfranchised, and Pueblo men were also enfranchised, but quote unquote uncivilized Indians defined as non-Pueblo Indians were disenfranchised. So, so there was 
is that early, um, early intent, which, and there's some other evidence, I think, for a strong sort of early position uh, in that direction. Despite that, there are several, several ways, and, and this happens fairly early, before the late 1850s, for instance, in the, as in the, the black case, there were several ways in which Mexicans pretty quickly uh, disenfranchised Pueblo Indians and cut them out of, of political control. Um, for instance, in 1849, a legislative body that was two-thirds Mexican a limited free citizen, limited citizenship rather to free white male inhabitants. Um, clearly, we assume that they meant to include themselves um, in that act, um, but they, they did not mean to include uh, Pueblo or other Indians. Uh, in 1853, similarly, there was a decision by the legislature to interpret the U.S. Congress's restriction of citizenship to free white males to Mexican males only and to exclude Indians, Pueblo Indians from, from that vantage point. And so I guess what I want to offer to you is that, that we can think about this as, as Mexicans, um, as, as, as showing two layers of racial positioning by Mexicans. Uh, the first layer uh, is allows Mexicans to be able to position themselves as white by virtue of positioning Pueblo Indians as non-white. Um, by defining Pueblo Indians as others, they could define themselves as subjects. And then the second layer of this racial positioning is that it, it was very advantageous for white Americans or for Euro-Americans um, because it allowed them to uh, first position themselves as generous with respect to Mexicans, generous in allowing Mexicans to claim this official whiteness. And, and that was important given the demographics. Um, second, it was an important part of the divide and conquer strategy, allowing whites to drive a wedge between Mexicans and uh, Pueblo Indians. And, and that was important given some of the early coalitions between Mexicans and Pueblo Indians, uh, which resisted the American occupation, in particular the Taos Rebellion of 1847, which we can talk more about if you'd like to, in questions and answers. Um, and then, or maybe I'll just make it questions and questions, because I'm getting, getting tired of hearing myself talk, and you probably are too. Um, and then the third way in which this was advantageous to, to white Americans or Euro-Americans, to distinguish them from white Mexicans, um, was to say that, that this allowed whites, and in particular white judges, to position themselves as racial protectors of Pueblo Indians as against uh, Mexican predators. And, and that you see in a variety of um, Supreme Court and lower court decisions in which white Euro-American judges are adjudicating disputes between Mexicans and Pueblo Indians, and generally over land and water, over resources, right? Um, and and uh, one of these is a is a, a case called De La O versus Acaba Pueblo from 1857, and in this case, uh, Supreme Court Justice Judge Benedict refers to Mexicans quote as the better instructed and more civilized race compared to Pueblo Indians, and on this basis goes on to criticize them for their treatment of Pueblo Indians. In other words, they should know better, they're better, they're more civilized, so they shouldn't be doing this. And so it allows the, the European American judges to position themselves in a way which, is, um, which, which also reflects very favorably on the American justice system as a place where Pueblo Indians got their rights vindicated in these case, case, cases. Um, there was another case um, in, in which the, one of the judges says, quote, it is gratifying to us to be the judicial agents affirming the rights of Pueblo Indians. And so, so there was a, a real way in which this, this 
moved by Mexicans to disenfranchise Pueblo Indians and distinguish themselves and distance themselves from Pueblo Indians very much served the interests of white Euro-Americans and, um, and, and promoted, as, as I've, I've said um, before, the entrenchment or um, uh, deepening of the white supremacy and, uh, and a kind of uh, racist hierarchy in, in New Mexico um, in the 19th century. Um, I'm thinking that we should we should stop. I was gonna so where I was gonna go next and and was to talk about Mexicans' reactions um, to charges that they were enslaving uh, Indians, uh, non Pueblo Indians, um, and and talk about that conflict and, and what that said about <coughs> racial positioning. Um, but I think I'm gonna go ahead and and stop uh, with just a, con a couple of concluding remarks, which are to say that. Um, that I've argued today that the American racial order, which of course has both a structural and an ideological component, uh, substantially impacted Mexican citizens uh, in New Mexico, making them se second class citizens, and also had these additional effects of um, allowing Mexicans to position themselves as a middleman racial group, as a group that had uh, some substantial domination over other non-white racial groups and some self-determination in their own, in terms of their own mm -hmm. destiny. Um, and I, I've tried to highlight for you, or at least give you a getting sense of the role that law played in all of this, and, and the the crucial role that, that legislation and um, and treaties, uh, legislation at the congressional level and at the territorial level played, and uh, judicial, judicial, judicial rulings as well. Um, I think where I want to end is just by emphasizing that there is this interesting way in which this period of, uh, of New Mexican history allows us both to see that Mexicans were able to successfully and legitimately sort of, you know, really, in a way, really claim whiteness in a way that was meaningful, but at the same time, in a way which very much served to further entrench white supremacy, um, and in that way sort of represented a kind of trade-off between short-term and long-term interests of Mexicans and other racially supported. So I will stop and be happy to hear your comments, questions. Yes? It seems to me you've, you've mentioned very little the early Spanish settlers from Spain who may have been Mexican citizens but were not mestizos. Aren't they, should they be considered a separate group? Or were the numbers so insignificant that you're looking at them with the alcohol of Mexico? I don't think there were very many of them by this time. I would, I would make that argument. Um, and in fact, one of the things that I think happens in this, in this, what what would be part three of my book is, is I think that's where we sort of, and some other people have written about this in recent years, that's where we sort of come into this sort of Spanish fantasy heritage, and and this kind of reclaiming of this, uh, these Spanish roots. But I think that at least everything that. Everything that's just in terms of, you know, and I, I come at this from a sociological position, um, er, er, those 60,000 people, very few of them were Spanish in any meaningful sense. Um, certainly culturally, right, the Spanish won. They were the first colonizers of this region, and so there was a, a dominance there. But in terms of the racial mixture, I think, uh, I, I would argue that these were, were mestizo peoples. Um, Although that's certainly there would have been exceptions, but in the main, that's what we're talking about, I think. Yes. Could you define then what you see those actually, you know, the makeup, what they, you know, racially what they were? Well, yeah. So I would I would define mestizos, and there are, again I guess there are a couple of ways we could look at this. Um, I would define mestizos as uh, Indian Spanish um, mixtures, and and in fact. There's a lot of the 
racial hostility towards Mexicans that's evident in the pre-war period during the war with Mexico and in the debate about the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo is on the basis that this is a mongrel race because it is basically an Indian race with some small Spanish mixture. And then some of the critique is actually that the Spanish are a mongrel race. And, you know, so there's really bad blood here. Even on the, the good part of the Spanish side is this really um, mixed uh, Moorish, you know, blood. Um, now, another way to, to answer the question is to look at some data about the Mexican population of, I think the year is 1650. And I just think these, these data are interesting. Um, 1650. So in, this is Mexico's population, which would have included um, New Spain at that time. There were equal numbers of at least according to anthropologist Martha Menchaca, equal numbers of Spaniards and blacks in Mexico, pure Spaniards, pure blacks, and 10 times the number of Indians as either Spaniards or blacks at that time. So if you think just mathematically, if you think about the population which would result, that is the mestizaje that is the, the predecessor here. So these people who racially have a lot of Indian in them were actually putting themselves above the Indians who were here. That's, That's right. That's right. So, so uh, yeah, and I mean, there's an important point, right, in which, and, 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 you know, there's a, I think there's a temptation to look at this, and we talk about it in the terms that we know today, right? But there's ways in which these categories didn't mean the same thing that, Certainly, they didn't mean the same thing they mean to us today, right? Um, I mean, I think that there are really important ways in which the Indian populations of New Mexico today are mestizaje populations. The, the populations that, that claim Indian status in New Mexico. And, and um, you know, and that, that adds a, a complicating layer. And I know that some of you in American Studies are familiar with the Seven Rael Galvez's work. Um, because he had a job offer from this department a few years back. He's the state historian of New Mexico. And uh, I think his work really is teaching us a lot about, and, and also um, James Brooks's work um, on, on earlier New Mexico history and inter-Indian and inter-Mexican Indian mixture, you know. So, so there's a way in which all of this is somewhat artificial to talk about these categories. You know, and, to, and you want to try to talk about them in a way that doesn't reify them. But at the same time, you know, I'm, I'm trying to sort of explain in a way how we got to where we got the 20th century. And, and I think that this period is a really key period for us. Uh, Dr. Gomez, you mentioned that uh, the elite Americanos were low behind this theory. Um, they position themselves as being white. What about the non elite Americanos? Well, I don't, I mean, I don't, you know, that's a, a sort of a, a really important question, but I don't think it's one I can answer from historical documents, because they're silent in the historical documents. So in a sense, you know, I'm taking out the slice of, I'm only, you know, the documents are written by European Americans overwhelmingly. Sometimes there's sort of Mexican authorship in a way, right, in these legislative acts, I think there is. Um, but it's only a slice of the Mexican population, right? And so, you know, I think that's a, that's a great question. I mean, I think that 